I wrote my first piece when I was eight, I think. It was terrible. It was a waltz. <laughs> Just hearing my piece played by a professional orchestra um, just should be an amazing experience. To get something performed is a, is a great opportunity. I just want to hear what it actually truly does sound like. I've been looking forward to it for about six weeks now, and it's just amazing that we're actually here already. It's quite embarrassing in a way because it's so much a part of yourself. You put so much into it and then everybody hears it, so... I think I'll have to try and contain my excitement because I've been looking forward to hearing it for so long. I've got lots of expectations of what's going to happen, but, I mean, it'll all be revealed, hopefully. It's amazing, yeah. I've never been to Manchester before and it's, it's all complaining. <laughs> Well, I hope I'm going to get a good performance of my piece. That would be really nice. Excited. I'm, I'm feeling excited about the whole event. Um, I think it's a necessary experience. I think it would be very good for me. <laughs> yeah, excited and daunted maybe a little bit, but I'm thoroughly looking forward to the weekend. For the 12 finalists who took part in this year's Lloyds Bank Young Composers Workshop, the prize was a winter weekend in Manchester. I joined them for three days of workshops and discussion with leading composers Graham Fitkin and Robert Saxton, Sally Beamish and John Kaskin. Aged between 14 and 24, they'd been selected from over 100 entrants who'd submitted a score to the panel of workshop leaders last year. For a developing composer, it's invaluable to have the chance to hear and work on a finished score with professional musicians. It's an opportunity that most young composers never get. Over the next few days, this fortunate dozen will each have about an hour and a half to work on their score with the musicians of the BBC Philharmonic in Studio 7. Working closely with the young composers and workshop leaders will be conductor Martin Brabins. The moment when a score first comes to life is always a special one, but particularly for David Haxton. Entirely self-taught, he's about to hear the first 15-minute movement of his cello concerto played by the orchestra's principal cellist, Peter Dixon. I've paired it all as I've been composing it, obviously, as you, as you do, but it, it's going to be fairly good to, to see it all done properly with the orchestra and everything, and not just like computer tape which allegedly sounds like instruments. So we'll start by playing the piece from the top. dedication I was very impressed by especially by Peter Dixon I have to say he's done a marvelous job and you know when you see when I see my piece played by him with all you know, he's, he's putting everything into it and so is Martin and the orchestra and it's that's ample encouragement I think that there is interest in new music and that if I write it it's not just going to be neglected
Merci. It's a terrifying thing for any composer to have to do, to stand in front of an orchestra. And some composers are terrible at this. I mean, even very distinguished composers, they can't do it at all. Um, but I think it's an important les lesson in how to behave um, in, in public and also in front of a large body of players. Borrig is the name of a remote, abandoned village in Sky. It was cleared um, by the landlords of people in the 1850s and there were quite brutal evictions and things against the people's wishes and they were sent away to New Zealand and Canada and places like that. Stuart McRae's family originally came from the Isle of Skye but he's now at Durham University in the final year of a music degree. But at the same time very sort of you can almost feel the, the sort of brutality that went on there so that's I think all I need to say about it. Stuart McRae's Borrowrig is a remarkable piece. His sense of the orchestra, his flair for the actual polyphonic layers and the families of the orchestra is really very highly developed for somebody of his age. He has a, a really instinctive sense of when to do something, and there's a remarkable moment in, in the piece when the strings start playing um, triadic held chords. Right, now, the first thing I'd like to do is to ask Stuart if he wants to um, hear any of it again in any slightly different, or very different ways. Let's try, should we try muted strings here? So okay, yeah, that mm. one. Yeah, that'd be try good. that. Do you prefer it with? I prefer it with mutes, yeah, I like that. 
So we, we, you remember that moment, everyone? We just put the mutes on the violins there to change the colour a little bit, so it's a little more Scottish, we feel. <laughs> Very Scottish. I think some of the things that Martin and Robert said um, about general sort of colour and um, just little details that j just sort of put the icing on the cake and you know it, it, it's not something that's just in that piece but next time I write a piece I'll think about things like that and you know it, it's just a very sort of big experience to, to have the opportunity to change things after you've already written the piece and so that's that's very valuable I think. The Selena Kay's quartet begins with three chords which are very memorable. They're not just any old three chords, they're very beautifully heard and spaced. And then there's a little upward gesture which is really maintained throughout the piece. It is a remarkably um, clever, but also very moving piece, beautifully written for the quartet. Selina Kay studies composition in Holland with Louis Andreessen. Most contemporary quartets that we've looked at have been very, um, how do I say this, sort of plinky plonk and, and weird and, you know, just relying on counting and so forth. But this is actually a work that uh, requires a great deal more than that. Certainly the opening section really sounds more like an earlier 20th century work than a later one. And I don't think that matters. I think it's very nice that our young composers feel that they don't have to be trendy in, in that sort of way to make something even more obscure, <laughs> if you like. I mean, we all absolutely love the piece, and there's, there's yeah, so right. much in it that we wanted to actually be able to exaggerate what, what you wanted. And one thing we found quite hard was, for instance, the opening, exactly how you, you know, how you wanted that, whether it was peaceful or whether it was expression, lots of expression. Well, or was it driven? I think, I think um, it's too beautiful right. at the moment. It needs to be much flatter right. and sort of less expressive, yeah. yeah. <laughs> in a way, you've written a very expressive opening, yeah. and um, in, a, in some ways, it's gone beyond you. Do you know what I mean? You're now roping it in again, and it's already out of the box. That's right. Yeah, I think it should be the whole piece should be kind of cool, right. you know? Right. Okay. Which, uh, I don't mean hip and trendy. I mean. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Did you want a little 
narrow vibrato or I, something I, slow? Or just vibrato on some notes? Just, I just want enough vibrato that you're able to change the dynamics, but not a wobble. So right. Kind of as if you're not allowed any vibrato, but you've just got to do a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was a bit worried about what you were saying. About All the dance. workshop sessions were packed into the first two days. With 12 composers and 12 scores to get through, it was a pretty intensive time for everyone. Even when grabbing a quick meal in the canteen, there still seemed to be only one topic of conversation. You've written the same dynamic every time. I find it very difficult to work out what people mean when they go beyond a certain point. I mean, you're playing things like Ligeti, he'll go to six Fs quite happily. And as far as I'm concerned, three Fs is as, means as low as possible, basically. Oh, well, your piece is louder than mine. <laughs> I've only been composing for, for two or three years, um, so to get something this early on to actually get it played by a, a professional symphony orchestra is, is a brilliant opportunity. I was, uh, I was amazed when I got the letter through the post. Tom Walton is at rugby school. He's never had a composition lesson in his life, but undeterred has written Blitzkrieg, a fiendishly difficult, some say unplayable, work for an imaginably large orchestra. <laughs> Blitzkrieg comes to mind straight away as something that was just a lot of noise and there were a lot of instances, well for instance there was a solo viola line in that which was completely impossible to hear against a vast wash of orchestral sound. <laughs> Thank you very much. As, as we've all noticed, this piece is in uh, basically in 9 4, nine beats in the bar. They're horrible. You could have written it all in 3 4, because 9 is just, I have to think 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. That's why my arm's aching. If, if it was just 1, 2, 3, it would be much easier for everyone, I think. But so. <laughs> <laughs> It's very difficult. Those nine fours are very difficult. Um, Martin Brevin said how hard that is, and it could be much easier if it was just in three all the time, um, which of course is true. But in a way, because it's so complex, because it's nine four bars, it makes people concentrate a bit harder, and that's interesting to see. I like that. Yeah, yeah, I like it. He wants it there. He wants it there. Come with a message from Professor oh. Keskin. He says, can we hear it without the snare? You're the boss. <laughs> Shh, could you just 
try that without the snares. Without snares, please, Rob. No, Tom's <laughs> extraordinary. He wasn't going to alter his, his no. mind at all for anything. Uh, I was really impressed by that. And it's it's one of the one of the interesting things is that I think in, in being a composer you have to get a sort of balance between obstinacy um, and knowing what you want to do and sort of self belief and if you like arrogance almost about what you want to do. And then also accepting advice from other people who do know better about certain things. See, thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. Well done. <laughs> keep it up, but ref keep it up, but refine it. Yeah. Is that the answer? Yeah. The guys had no composition. Absolutely. <laughs> I would have loved to have been there. Yes. Yeah. Most young people feel at some point in their lives they want to change the world, and if you're given the chance to write an orchestral piece or something which is going to make a very big impression. Um, then you will try and do something which is, you know, very original and unique and experimental. At the same time, you've got to be really rather practical in realising these ambitions. Composers generally compose because they need to compose. I'm quite often inspired to write a piece through frustration at something, and I and I and I can't say it. I can't tell someone else something, and so I. I write a piece. In a way, it uh, stops me getting into too much trouble. line was very fast, very loud, pizzicato, um, quintuplets. And this went on for oh, about half a page, fortissimo, and it just isn't possible. I mean, you could play it for a couple of bars, but then your hand starts to seize up. And uh, you just can't, if it had been very quiet, it would have been all right, but it was very loud, you've really got to uh, go at it, and it's just not, um, just not practical. Generally, double basses can be a bit... You know that uh, while we're talking about double basses, that do 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 it's impossible pizzicato. Right. So what what we did where well, you've got boom 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 we did that pizzicato and the be do 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 be do 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 be do do arco. It really isn't. Even so, arco is really exhausting. Well, we could ask them. We're just talking about be do 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 do. What about Arco? Well, Arco was all right. Yeah. All the composers had written music for a different combination of instruments. The virtuosic drone for two percussionists was perhaps the most different of all of them. Its composer, Geoffrey Hannon, studies in Cambridge with Alexander Gurr. Just the oral experience is very important and something which um, every composer needs. It's not enough to sit at a desk. You need some sort of physical contact uh, with what you've been writing. And uh, only then can you, can you make the appropriate revisions and, and uh, attend to the practicalities that don't often occur as you're, as you're writing. <laughs> there we go. One, two, three, four. Drome is a very interesting attempt to try and create a, um, a, a, a climax, if you like, in music by sheer means of sheer relentlessness.
um, the bongo should be the same pitch as the boo band. Yes. Yeah, well, is it possible to do something about that? Not for these instruments because this bongo we tried it just won't. Right. So it's the highest it can it's go. The, the trouble is a boo band has got a very limited range actually. Yeah. Okay. Well, just hit the the bongo about 50 times as loud. <laughs> right. Yeah. I mean, really. The, the main thing that all the composers, all 12 of them were, were interested in, actually, was writing a piece of music uh, full stop. Uh, and that means that they weren't actually concerned with style or the fact that it might have been done before. Playing Christopher Liedem's uh, four miniatures for the clarinets has been so such a different experience from all the other pieces. I was talking to him yesterday, and he he's obviously a very different sort of composer to the rest of them. He he's he's very traditional. He said he does like a good tune, and um, he actually said he gets sick of endless banging and crashing. So he's writing music of a different sort. It's very approachable. It's very tuneful. It's characterful. It's really good fun to play, and all the clarinets who've been doing it have enjoyed it enormously. I actually started with a computer program, which my brother got for Christmas, and then I went on and had lessons in composition, and it's developed from there. Everything he's written is he's written using a computer. And my feeling is that he's allowed the computer to make decisions for him. You know, what is the character of the music? The character of the music is not the notes. The character is something beyond the notes. Um, John, John Kaskin told me to throw away my computer. Um, and he even instructed me on which sort of pencil to use and where to get manuscript paper and that I'm to use a 2B lead in a, a 0.5 propelling pencil, apparently. <laughs> I think imitation is the first way, imitation and improvisation, and just sort of exploring different ways of, of writing music, whether it's programmatic or whether it's just thinking about a structure which just follows a line which goes from there to there. That's, that might be the basis for the piece. It might be that, or it might be the wild moors on, in, in Scotland. <laughs> Seven men of my dart went with Bonnie Prince Charlie on his um, escapades around Scotland in 1745. So it's really the Culloden battlefield before and after. And the section in the middle is a much more violent section, and, and that's where the battle happens. But it's more than that. It can be anything, really, whether there's a before and after and something happening in the middle. Stephen Manium studied composition at Durham with Philip Cashingham. One of the problems for young composers um, is knowing why you're writing a piece. And I think if you've got words or you've got some program or story or something which will serve as a thread, um, and that thread gives you the direction of the piece, but also creates the, the mood or the atmosphere. There's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that at all.
it was inspired.